Hi, this is Sid and I'll be talking about combined task and motion planning through a planner independent interface layer. In order to build robots that can accomplish high level tasks on their own, we want them to do both high level planning and low level planning. So take for example the task of laying out the robot, uh, sorry, laying out a table. We need high-level planning to figure out long-term strategies. For example, should we use the tray? And if we use the tray, in what order should we stack things in? That kind of stuff. As well as low-level planning, where we want to find out exactly the motion planning trajectories that should be followed to do each of these simple actions. So the question that we're going to investigate here is if we can utilize off-the-shelf task planners and motion planners in such a system. And our main idea is going to be to abstract away the continuous values using symbolic references. So I'm going to present our main approach, um, discuss some of its theoretical properties, and then conclude with a bunch of experiments on the PR2 simulator as well as the PR2 robot. So task planners and motion planners have distinct and complementary strengths. Task planners are very good at finding so, uh, solutions in combinatorial search spaces and they mostly do this by uh, using some very innovative techniques for finding heuristics automatically given a domain specification but they're not so great at finding uh, paths in continuous high dimension continuous search spaces which is what motion planners are very good at right and for this they use a variety of random sampling methods and convex optimization methods on the other hand, motion planners are not directly applicable to discrete action sequencing. So this seems to be like a perfect combination. And the obvious solution here seems to be to take a task planner, use it to compute a task plan to solve a problem, and then go ahead and implement each of the actions in the produced output using a motion plan. And then stitch together all the motion plans and that should be the end of the problem. But it turns out it's not so straightforward. To see this, let's look at a discrete specification for the blocks world planning domain. And this is something that people in planning have studied for ages. So what we're saying here is you can pick up a block using a gripper. If the block is on the table, the gripper is empty and the block is clear. By clear here, we mean that the block has nothing on it. And the effect of this action is going to be that you're holding block one, which is no longer on the table, and the gripper is no longer empty. So this has been studied for ages and is largely considered solved, at least for the blocks world. But the interesting thing is, is if you look at the implementation of a real world pick and place task in robotics, almost no approach actually uses a task planner to find a plan and then implement it. And that's strange because the planning community thinks that this is the end of the problem. But it turns out that there is a good reason why these discrete specifications cannot be used. And that's because this kind of a description doesn't really consider the geometric locations of the robot, the hand or the object, and the geometric preconditions of the problem, of, the, of this kind of an action. And to see this, let's look at a 2D specification of the same problem. Okay. And here I'm making it 2D simply to the intuition clearer, the same kinds of problems and solutions extend to higher dimensional real cases. So now we have these two blocks one and two and to grip it or to grasp a block we are going to assume that the gripper simply has to align itself with one of the edges. And we are also going to assume that there is a free area where if you drop something then it no longer obstructs other objects. So this assumption is not made in any of our real experiments. Okay, so now we can specify everything accurately. We can say that to pick up a block, we need all these other arguments which tell us exactly what the current location of the block, the gripper, are and what is the target pose that the gripper should end up, as well as the path that the gripper should take to reach that target grasping pose. And this is because the path is in the agent's control. So this is very good, it's very accurate. The precondition is saying there should be no obstruction in the path. And as you can see, in this case, that's not the case. So you cannot actually pick up 
block one. So everything seems to be fine and we've described this domain accurately. But the problem with this if a specification is that because of these continuous arguments, we've ended up with a situation where our state is continuous. We need infinitely many facts to express it. And we also have an infinite branching factor because our actions have continuous arguments. So there's a standard way to deal with that, and that is to do discretization. So how do we discretize this problem? Well, let's say that we have 10 points each in X and Y, and let's say we have five objects. It turns out that to just specify the initial state in that kind of a discretization, we are going to have to express about 50,000 facts. And that's a very small problem. So if we extend the same ideas to the PR2, then we end up with having to write down about 10 to the 14 objects for uh, facts for just 10 objects. So if we take our test domain, something like this, where we need to pick up that red object, we're going to be just stuck at the stage where creating input, where we are creating input for the planning problem. Right? So this is not going to work. But there is a way to use task planners and intuitively, let's uh, look at it as follows. So what we want is the high level plan to say something like, we want to pick up block one after going to its grasping pose, right? Now its grasping pose here is a symbolic reference. It's not a real value. So we want an interface layer, which is going to take plans like this, extract the pose references in it, and search through possible values of those pose references. Now, for each value that it finds, it's going to use an arbitrary motion planner to figure out whether that pose reference is feasible. That is, whether or not there is a motion plan reaching that pose. Now, in this case, it's going to search for all the possible values and finally conclude that there is no such plan. So then what we want the interface layer to do is fix a pose reference, find a particular trajectory for reaching that pose reference. So it fixes both the trajectory and the pose reference and then report the errors corresponding to those fixed values. So in this case, it chooses a trajectory and says, okay, block two obstructs that trajectory. Right? Now, the important thing is to communicate that information, it doesn't really need to use the values of the pose references. Right? So now we can use that information, update the state in the task planning level where that error occurred, and go ahead and find a new task plan. So now the new task plan is going to say something like, okay, pick up block two, release it in the free area, then come back, pick up block one. And we can go ahead and execute that plan and it works and the goal is reached. Okay, so how do we formalize this? So let's talk about the general algorithm. At, in the big picture, what we're going to have is take a task planner and a motion planner and treat them as black boxes. All the work, interesting work is going to be done in the interface layer, where we're going to get a task plan with pose references, we're going to create some instantiations for those references, and figure out using a motion planner whether that instantiation is feasible. If it isn't, then we're going to get the errors and translate them into logical facts, give them back to the task plan. If, they, if the pose instantiation is feasible for the entire plan at some point, then we have. Okay, so let's look at a specific example again, slightly more formally done now. So let's say we have a simple task plan, which is to pick up block B1 after going to its grasping pose. And so here, GP of B1 is the grasping pose of B1, and that's our pose reference. So this is used just as a symbol. It's not a evaluated function call there. Okay, so we take that task plan, and our interface layer goes through a bunch of sampled instantiations for GP of B1. For each of them, it tries to figure out whether or not there is a feasible motion plan. And if it turns out that there is, then the problem is solved and we are done. So that's the simplest case. But often what's going to happen is that it's not going to find a feasible motion plan for any of the pose instantiations it considered. So in that case, it then fixes one of the pose instantiations, the first one here, and then figures out what the obstructions were in this case, let's say it found that the wall was, in, was obstructing the motion plan. Right? It's going to update the task planning state and invoke a, an arbitrary task plan and at that point to find a new solution. Now it's going to turn out now that the task planner doesn't know how to move the wall away. So it says, okay, there's no solution corresponding to this error. Then our interface layer picks the next instantiation, 
figures out what the obstructions are. Let's say an object P2 obstructs that. And let's say that when we update the state, the task planner finds that it has a way of moving object 2. Right? So then it goes ahead, finds a new plan. And now our uh, search for refinement or motion planning is going to continue with this new task group. And then it's going to simply reverse the way I described it. Okay, so this algorithm is guaranteed to be correct under a bunch of sufficient conditions. And I'm not going to go into too many details here, but the interesting thing is that this uh, these conditions are only sufficient. So in many of our experiments, they do not hold actually, but the algorithm still works. Okay, so let's look at some results. Now, the in all of our results we use, in all of our implementation, we use Open Brave as the simulator. Uh, we used Trajopt as the motion planner. And for task planner, we used two different task planners. FF was used whenever there was uh, no constraint on plan costs. And we used FD or fast downward whenever plan cost was a concern. Okay, so in the first example, we want to pick up an object from a drawer. And there are two cases. Either the object is too far inside, so you have to pull the drawer out more, or the object is close to the edge and you have to pull the object less. Now the catch is that there's an object outside the drawer which has to be removed if you want to open the drawer more than a certain amount. And the interesting thing is that the task planner cannot do that kind of reasoning, but it is this exact kind of reasoning which is going to determine which plan is going to work. That is whether or not it has to move the outer object. So in the case where the obstruction ne is necessary, we see that the system figures out that it first has to move the outer object, then go ahead and pick up the inner object. Now, in the second case here, we see that the system actually figures out that it doesn't need to move the outer object. It can open the drawer just enough and pick that object, and you can see here that there is no collision, so everything is fine. So, the interface layer actually succeeded in this example to provide that kind of an interesting reasoning, geometric reasoning, and have its effect be propagated into the task plan. Okay, so this second example is a little more tricky. Here, what we want to do is pick up the red object, and we have this cluttered table, and there's no free area, so the system has to figure out where to place objects. In order to make the problem harder, we also added the constraint that it can only pick objects up from the side. So there's no special geometric reasoning algorithm that's being used here. It's just our regular backtracking search. And you'll see sometimes it picks up the same object twice, and that's because it first places them at a location and then later figures, uh, figures out that that location is still in obstruction with something else that it had to place. There it goes and picks up the target object. Okay, so this kind of uh, grasping in cluttered situations has been looked at uh, in the literature, but using some special purpose algorithms designed for just that task. Okay, so this was all in the simulator. And finally, to do this in practice, we uh, designed this dinner layout domain where the object is in a starting location where it has a bunch of um, bowls that it needs to cups and bowls that it needs to lay out, and there's a tray that it can use if it wants to. It's not necessary. And we only told it, using the task plan uh, action costs, that the initial location is far from the target location. So we said that in all everything initially is in one room, and to move to the other room, you have an action that costs um, pretty high. Okay, so if we see this, the system figures out that it's better to use the tray. But once that's done, it still needs to figure out the order of stacking. The task planning layer just knows that it can stack smaller objects on top of bigger ones, but it doesn't know which object is smaller or bigger. And that's again done using interface with the lower level reasoning, which figures out object diameters and propagates that information through errors in existing task plans that, it, uh, that the interface layer gets.
So now it's going to lay out everything in the target table and it's going to do this fancy handoff operation. Uh, this action can be done at any stage for any pickup. So it's only adding to the complexity of the planning process. But what we did was at the high level, we said that if you pick up something on the left with your right hand, then you have a high action cost. And the same thing happens if you pick up something on the right with your left hand. So again, it doesn't know at the high level layer whether something, whether a target pose is on its left or right. So that's also figured out through our interface layer by comparing the relative poses at the lower level and then converting them to predicates. And again, this is converted through the interface of errors in existing trajectories. Okay, so that's the dinner layout completed. And here's a quantitative summary of the results. Um, our system effectively solves the drawer problem and the dinner domain problems in 600 seconds. In the cluttered table problem, as we increase the number of objects, we are actually keeping the size of the table fixed, so the problem is getting more and more constrained. And you can see that the success rate in 600 seconds is dropping as we increase the number of objects on the table. Uh, here's a histogram describing the times taken for all the problem instances. And we can see that even for the 40 object cluttered problem, the most of the problems are, or most of the instances are actually solved in a short amount of time. And there are these outliers. And of course, then there are problems that it could not solve at all in 600 seconds. Okay, so to conclude, we have a method that uses arbitrary task planners and motion planners in a modular fashion. And the main thing is that in doing so, we avoid the exponential com complexity that would arise if we just did discretization. And one of the main things here is that we are forgetting the uh, constraints or the logical facts that when that would go with a different instantiation of those pose references in every iteration. Right? Our solution is uh, based on symbolic references to continuous values. And the main requirement is that we should be able to detect failures in uh, the computation of low-level tra trajectories, and we should be able to express them using logical facts so that the task planner can replan using those facts. We also have an online version which doesn't use, uh, which uh, doesn't need to use any simulator or a low-level model. And the good thing is that because we make no assumption about the task planner and the motion planner, this approach is going to scale with advances in both of these fields, even if we just let, let the code be alone. Um, in the future, we plan to make this, develop this into a complete algorithm and also develop domain independent heuristics for improving the efficiency of the pose instantiation process. Thank you for listening.